Close Source is brought to you with support from the following sustainable brands. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Picnic wear, a slow fashion brand made by hand in New York City from vintage and dead stock textiles. Picnic wear strives for minimal waste, but maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Find Picnic wear on Instagram at Picnic wear, and that's where W E A R and at www.picnicwear.com. No flight back vintage, bringing fun new life to old things always using recycled and secondhand materials to make dope-ass shit for dope-ass people. See more on Instagram at No Flight Back Vintage. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room. All while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Shop Journal Vintage, specializing in upcycled, handmade, and vintage fashion for all genders. Owner Laura makes each piece by hand with love in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with an emphasis on upcycled menswear, tie-dye, modern jewelry, cottagecore collars, and everything in between. Shop Journal makes pieces they love and hopes you will too. Getting dressed should always be fun. See more on Instagram at shop underscore journal. Old Flame Mending helps you keep your clothes intact through clothing repair, visible mending, and tailoring. Through extending the life of textiles, Old Flame Mending makes your pieces not only wearable and functional again, but also unique and beautiful. This mending duo is based in Pittsburgh, but they take mail-in mending orders from anywhere in the U.S. For more information, visit them at oldflamemending.com or follow them on Instagram at Old Flame Mending. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer. But Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro-business. She's the one-woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one-woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made-to-measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at DylanPage.com and find us on Instagram at Dylan Page Life and Style. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Wide-Eyed Vintage, a curator of truly covetable vintage from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Wide-Eyed Vintage encourages the experimental spirit of dressing up and will provide you with all the special pieces that will make your wardrobe truly unique. 
Dedicated to preserving the craftsmanship of clothes, wide-eyed vintage only selects pieces that are well-made, pieces that have been proven to last beyond their lifetimes, so you too can enjoy them for more lifetimes to come. See more on Instagram at wide underscore eyed underscore vintage. Karen Kinney Studio. Located in Western Massachusetts, Karen specializes in handcrafted earrings from found, upcycled, and repurposed fabrics, as well as other eco-friendly curios, all with a hint of nostalgia, a dollop of whimsy, a dash of color, and 100% fun. Karen is an artist slash designer who believes the materials we use matter. See more on Instagram at Karen Kinney Studio or online at www.cKinney.com. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. St. Evans is a New York City-based vintage retailer that is dedicated to bringing you those special vintage pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just an online store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a new charitable organization each month, amplifying and supporting causes like food insecurity, racial justice, homelessness, and LGBTQ plus support. For the month of April, St. Evans will be donating to Welcome to Chinatown, a grassroots initiative that is supporting and amplifying community voices to preserve one of New York City's most vibrant neighborhoods. Your vintage purchase from St. Evans supports a small, women of color run business while giving back to the collective community we're all a part of. New Vintage is released every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time at wearsaintevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's at where St. Evans. Shop vintage. Do good and wear St. Evans. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles by embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment. I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that is reading so much stuff in preparation for Capitalism Month. Seriously, if you see me around and there's just a little bit of smoke coming out of my ears, don't worry. I'm just really going hard with all kinds of economic theories. <laughs> I'm your host, Amanda. This is episode 66, the first episode of Capitalism Month, which other people like to call April. Today, you'll get to meet Kelsey Garner, the designer and founder of KS Garner, a slow fashion brand based in Arizona that makes the coolest clothes in all sizes. We'll talk about all kinds of things, including the link between shopping and addiction, the importance of making clothes for everyone, and 
this seems random, but makes sense. Tips for minimizing the plastic in your life. You know, I'm on an anti-plastic journey myself. Uh, what else? I also have a phone call from Jessica of Vino Vintage, and I'm going to give you a really intense <laughs> beginner lesson in capitalism. Like, I was like, ah, uh, it'll just be this little thing, and then it turned into like 10 pages of notes. So don't say that I didn't warn you. <laughs> But first, I must remind you, as I do every episode, that if you're interested in supporting my work on Close Horse via Patreon, you can find out more at patreon.com slash Close Horse Podcast. You can also send a direct donation via Venmo to at crystal underscore visions. And thank you, as always, to everyone who supports me on Patreon, who sends money via Venmo, who recommends the podcast to friends, writes a review just shares our content on Instagram. All of that is so meaningful to me and I am so grateful for it. So thank you so much. Also, I want to remind you that the application process for the residencies at closehorse.world is officially open for just one more week. So stop procrastinating. I know you are. Get out your computer and fill out that application. It only takes a few minutes. You can check out the job descriptions as well as this application at closehorse.world. We don't need your resume. It's not super fancy. Don't stress. These roles are so essential to growing our blog, to reaching more people, and continuing to give a platform for all of the incredible, talented, passionate, just super cool people in our community. So stroll on over to closehorse.world, check it all out, and get involved with us. We can't wait to meet you. Okay, did you hear that? That's the Close Horse hotline ring, and it's a call from Jessica of Vino Vintage. Hey, Amanda, it's Jessica from Vino Vintage. Um, I had a thought about returns and how many there are. I know you've talked about returns on the pod in the um, in the past, but recently I started working at a like a midsize um, like clothing boutique. That's pretty. Um, they're not huge, but they're pretty well known. Um, I won't say what they are just because I'm currently working there. Um, but I just noticed I've been there about a month and. There are just so many returns, so many online returns that people bring into the store. Um, like, it's crazy. It's so much. And I just never really realized that in the past because my previous retail, like, experience was at Buffalo Exchange, which is, like, secondhand clothing. And the return policy there is um, exchange only. And... We didn't really have that many returns. There would be, like, return or exchanges because that's all we really offered, um, like, every now and then, but nothing crazy. And it's just that this new job I have, because their return policy is so flexible and just so easy for the customer, it's just the insa- the returns are insane. And so I was thinking if more retailers were kind of like Buffalo Exchange in a way that all they offered were either exchanges or, you know, sell items for final sale, like just a little bit more strict. I feel like people would be more conscious of what they're buying. They would probably, you know, be more likely to try it on in the store, um, make sure it's like the fit that they want if they are stuck with it. I don't know, just something to think about with consumption month coming to an end. I just wanted to add that note for you. Um, but yeah, returns are crazy and it's just, it's more work for the employees, it's more work for the customer to having to drive it back to the store or ship it or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I just think re- more retailers should be more strict with their return policy so people actually buy what they actually want. Um, anyway, that's all. Love the pod. Talk to you soon. Bye. You know, I have to say, well, I've said it before here, uh, returns have gotten crazier and crazier with each passing year. Pre-pandemic, about 5 to 10% of all in-store purchases were returned. That's not that much. It's pretty. It's been pretty much at the same level for decades, while 15 to 40% of online purchases have been returned, with clothing specifically leaning more towards that 40% end of the spectrum. And the ease of making these returns is a big deal to customers. I was actually doing some reading about this. It's like just when you think... You've read everything about returns. There's more to read. (laughs) 92% of customers say they probably won't shop a retailer again if the return process is expensive or difficult. 
And retailers know this. They've made returns even easier for customers, but they have not really worked on what to do with all of those returns. They haven't figured that part out yet. Analysts think the retail industry as a whole is on the verge, like maybe in the next year, of seeing more than a trillion dollars worth of returns each year. That's how much it's been climbing. And as you know, a big portion of those returns are going to the landfill because retailers feel that it's just too expensive to cover these reverse logistics of receiving returns, inspecting them, and putting them back into inventory. Once again, they've invested a lot of time and money into making the returns easy for you, the customer, and they've kind of ignored their end of the problem. (laughs) As Jessica mentions, Even when you return something to a store, it's a lot of work to get it back out onto the sales floor because you have to make a tag, re-tag it, hang it out, put it away. You might have to look up all the SKU information. It is a time suck, and time is money when you're paying people to do things. At the same time, retailers are somewhat at fault for creating these excess returns because well, they've been doing a lot of dumb stuff all in the name of, you know, maximizing profits, ironically, right? They encourage larger total purchases by getting you to add a lot of impulsive add-ons to hit that free shipping threshold that they've set. You know, like spend 50 or or $100 and get free shipping. You're 7 12 $15 away. You're going to add something else to your cart because in your mind, the shipping is going to be 10 or 15 bucks anyway, Why not get something for it? But as we all know, there is no such thing as free shipping. That's a different episode. But you can see why the average customer is motivated to get that free shipping and get another thing that almost feels free along with it, right? This leads to a whole lot of returns. When someone realizes that the thing that they actually went to the website to buy isn't that great, and they want to return it. And they say, well, I might as well return the other random stuff I added to my cart too, just to get that free shipping. Retailers have also cast good and consistent fit by the wayside in order to, you know, save money and bring in stuff faster and faster. So there's no consistency. Their size charts don't make sense because nothing fits the same way. And so more stuff gets returned. And for more background on why that happens, how that happens, you should check out Meredith's essay at closehorse.world. It just came out a few days ago called When Less Is Not More, where she talks about how that faster timeline and smaller headcount has made more and more clothing fit more and more strangely than ever. Now that I'm saying this out loud, though, I realize that we need to get Meredith back on the pod to talk about it with us here. So Meredith, call me. We have a lot to talk about. Anyway, all this bad and inconsistent fit also increases the volume of returns and the bad size charts and just... It's a mess, right? Retailers sort of created this returns mess for themselves. This mess being lots of stuff being returned. Then they realized that actually making these items resellable is, quote, too expensive. And then, therefore, they find themselves losing lots of money on this, quote, lost merchandise every year. But... They're afraid to make returns more difficult to stop us from returning stuff so much because rather than us returning less stuff, we'll just go shop somewhere else because there's always going to be someone who's going to give us a free return, free shipping, all that stuff. Now, I would love to feel sorry for these retailers. Oh, oh, what a mess they're in, these poor guys. But instead... I'm sorry for a lot of other things. I'm sorry for the planet because all of these items are heading to a landfill. I'm sorry for the planet because the carbon footprint to make and transport these items was massive and then returning them just made the carbon footprint even bigger. I'm sad because energy and cotton and metals and all kinds of resources were wasted to make future garbage that became Garbage a lot faster than even these retailers planned. And I'm sorry for the workers who made pennies to make these items less and less with each year. They were exhausted, struggled, but somehow met that retailer's unrealistic and very short timeline. And I'm sorry for all the customers, all of us, because 
Those retailers have to cover all that free shipping and unsellable merchandise somehow, and they do that by reducing costs as much as possible, using cheaper and cheaper fabrics, shoddier trims, and skipping the actual fitting process, all so they could still make a lot of profit after all that waste. My name is Amanda McCarty, and as you know, I was once a returnaholic. And my returnaholicism, is that the term? Is that the clinical term? <laughs> was caused by my love of free shipping, of impulse shopping, shopping with my feelings, and feeling as if returning something was the, quote, right thing to do, and somehow the more, quote, sustainable option. We know now that returns are not sustainable, just even more waste, and I literally do not give a fuck about retailers losing money on returns, but I am frightened by the sheer volume of waste, of lower quality clothing, and workers making less and less money for their work just so retailers can more easily forget the things they throw out. We have to say no to free shipping thresholds. We have to resist impulse shopping. We have to stop over shopping with the plan of returning most of it. We've all done it. I've got a wedding coming up. I need a dress. I'll order a 10. I'll keep one. We can't do that anymore. The odds of those nine other dresses ever going to a new owner are so slim. I know it's hard, especially when shopping IRL is so difficult right now, but we must change our behavior around returning stuff because we cannot count on retailers to make the situation better for us. They will not. They have no reason to right now. Thank you so much, Jess, for calling and sharing your thoughts on this. And as always, getting messages from any of you on the hotline is one of my favorite things. So if you have something to say about returns, about capitalism, about all the other stuff we've been talking about lately, or just another question or idea for me, please give me a call. The phone number is 717-925-7417. If you don't like to call on the phone, but you still have a lot to say with your voice, you can also send me a voice memo that you record on your phone or computer and just email that to me at amanda at world. All right. Well, it's capitalism month. So let's let's just start at the beginning. Let's talk a little bit about what capitalism is. We hear a lot about capitalism on social media, and we know that being hashtag anti-capitalist is a conversation that's happening right now. But while we have this idea that capitalism might be bad for us, bad for our community, we don't know exactly how or why. I feel like we kind of gloss over capitalism in school. Uh, I don't know about any of you. I did take an economics class in high school. I felt like we never really specifically talked about capitalism as a word, but we did talk about some of the pillars and market factors around it. I, I, I don't know. You tell me. Did you learn a lot about capitalism in high school? I'm committed to breaking it all down for you this month, just in case your economics class was as uninformative as mine. And while I'm doing this, I'm also going to show how fashion is a part of it. I'm not an economist. I just want to say that again. Like I said, just had some economics in high school. I would call myself an economics hobbyist. I don't know if that's a thing. Maybe I'm just a nerd, but I do find economics really fascinating. I think they're really tied to social dynamics, social trends, consumption habits, all of these other things that really are at the core of what we talk about here at Close Force all the time. And it's been really fun to break down capitalism and see the parallels in fast fashion and in other areas of my life too. So hopefully you will enjoy this as much as I am. So capitalism is defined as an economic system in which a country's trade, industry, and profits are controlled by private companies instead of by the people whose time and labor power those companies. As soon as you read that definition, you're like, oh shit, that's why capitalism is so lopsided and predatory. Once again, all the profits, all the assets for the most part are controlled by companies, not by the people doing the work. That's the simple breakdown of capitalism. 
Let's travel way back in time for a moment to the 16th century when feudalism had been the status quo for quite a while. Feudalism was a social system that existed in Europe during the Middle Ages in which people worked and fought for nobles who gave them protection and the use of land in return. So peasants, also known as serfs, you may have heard that word, it's S-E-R-F-S, not, you know, go out and catch the waves, that's with a U. So these serfs owned nothing, while the nobles owned all of the land and wealth. Peasants, these serfs, would live on their local noble's land. That noble was called a lord. And yes, there's no question of gender here because no woman would have ever owned anything. So we're going to be talking about these lords as a he. Uh, The serfs would give their lord their allegiance, their labor, and a share of their crops in exchange for military protection. And to be clear here, the lords exploited the peasants often forcing them into abject, brutal poverty. This might sound like capitalism to you, but it's not quite because the lords didn't make profit off of this. They were just able to live without working because they received enough food and goods from their serfs to live a pretty comfortable and mostly idle existence. But you can't accumulate food year over year like you can money. You can't just stack it up in a vault. Unlike money and property, food does not appreciate in value over time. So there was a very clear limit to the wealth that these nobles could accumulate. Basically, rather than accumulating wealth, they were just consuming it (laughs) to survive, right? But survive lavishly indeed. Nonetheless, this system, like capitalism, created very defined haves, the lords here, and have-nots everyone else. And the group of haves, the nobility, was very small, while the have-nots, the peasants, the serfs, were a massive group. Put a pin in that idea because it does come up again, okay? Also, and I think this is another very important distinction between feudalism and capitalism, the average serf had no idea of the outside world. Most serfs lived within five miles of where they were born. They didn't travel, They didn't have social media to tell them what other people in other countries were doing with their time. They didn't know that they were missing out on anything. They certainly probably didn't even have a full grasp of the wealth of the nobility. And for the most part, they would have been very distanced, perhaps not geographically, but definitely highly distanced socially from their lords and the rest of the nobility. And these serfs certainly weren't thinking about how unfair the lack of upward mobility was. They were just like, this is what we do. These are our lives. They will not change. So it was not very equal. It was not very fair. But thanks to serfs being too busy serving their lords to question why they were serving their lords, feudalism lasted for a long time until the arrival of the Black Death, aka the plague, that killed off up to 60% of Europe's entire population, about 25 million people. More than half of the people who lived in Europe were gone. I'm just going to stop here for a second and say this. It's just something to think about. Granted, COVID, I hope, will not be as devastating as this. But spoiler I'm about to tell you that the Black Death basically ended feudalism. What if COVID could be the beginning of a shift out of our current capitalist system into a new system that maybe takes the best parts of capitalism, but combines it with some other great ideas out there, you know, maybe like socialism? That's another episode conversation, but it's just something to think about because one thing that the pandemic has proven is that we can make drastic changes to our lives pretty fast. We don't want to squander everything we've learned and experienced in the past year by going back to quote normal. What if the new normal is something better than the normal of the past? Think about it. We'll talk about it again later. So yeah. I did spoil it for you, but the Black Death essentially caused a collapse of the feudalist system because, like I said, more than half of Europe died. A new economy began to develop as a new class of merchants began to trade with other countries. 
other countries that hadn't been impacted by the plague in the way that Europe had been. This had a few effects, and here's another spoiler. None of these effects were good. Uh, Local economies collapsed because these merchants were bringing in cheaper goods from around the world. And as the primary conduit for these goods, these merchants could dictate the pricing, the production, the quality, the exact product that they wanted, etc., Is this starting to sound a little familiar to you? I mean, they basically created a system in which no domestic goods could ever be as cheap and desirable as these imported goods that the merchants were bringing in. Well, this desire for cheap goods from other places led to all kinds of horrible things that we are still dealing with the repercussions of right now, colonialism, slavery, and imperialism. At the same time this merchant class was developing, rural peasants, those former serfs, found themselves evicted from the land they had farmed for generations for their lords. Homeless, penniless, because remember, they were already living in poverty. They didn't have savings. They found themselves moving to the city and selling their only asset, their labor. The state itself actually worked hand in hand with these new merchants and other business owners, a.k.a capitalist to dictate a maximum wage for these workers. Yes, that's right. Maximum wage, a highest wage that anyone could be paid and no one ought to be paid more than that by the law. The general feeling of the state and the capitalists was that these peasants were unskilled labor, hopelessly pitiful people, and there was no good reason to pay them fairly. This primitive version of capitalism existed until the 1700s when manufacturing started to develop. And this is when capitalism really started to blow up, especially as we move into the industrial age. It allowed all the wealth accumulated by the merchants and capitalists of the previous centuries to continue to grow, to be handed down from generation to generation within families, and begin to widen that wealth gap beyond even that of the feudal era. Because the difference here was that money accumulates over time and assets increase in value, whereas the crops the lords were receiving from the serfs, they were just consumed as fast as they appeared. You couldn't hoard them for generations. (laughs) There was no ceiling to the amount of wealth one could accumulate under this primitive version of capitalism and in today's modern capitalism as well. You know, I read recently, we live in the golden era of the billionaire. Apparently, we have twice as many billionaires as we did 20 years ago. Capitalism is built off of five pillars, and I'll be breaking these down throughout the month, but let's define them just a little bit right now. The first one is private property. Private property allows people to own tangible assets like land and houses and intangible assets like stocks and bonds. A lot of the inequality of capitalism sort of starts with the concept of private property because in its purest form, you're probably already picking up on this based on the story of the development of capitalism, capitalism depends on two groups of people. One receives income entirely from ownership of assets, sort of like those lords and nobles of yesteryear, if you will, while the other group's income comes solely from their own labor. That first group, the one that owns all the assets, is small and often wealthy. The other group is significantly larger and generally poor with a middle class income at best. Like that's the best case scenario. And yes, this working class can own property like houses and maybe even some stocks, but we've seen a widening gap in real estate ownership with each generation. And thanks to practices like redlining, we have made home ownership and accumulation of assets and generational wealth even more difficult for anyone who is not white in the United States. You've probably heard the term generational wealth thrown around, and it refers to any kind of asset that families pass down to each generation, including land, money, stocks, and even entire companies. Capitalism builds on historically inherited inequalities of class, 
ethnicity, and gender. So if your grandparents or great, 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 great grandparents owned a lot of property or cash, then odds are very high that you're set up for a better and easier life with access to better healthcare, education, and just so many more opportunities. If your grandparents or great, 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 great grandparents lived in poverty and or were literally enslaved people, well, then chances are high that you face a lot of challenges and you don't have access to good healthcare, education, and opportunities. You know, over time, this gap widens between the haves and have nots as the growth of profits generated by assets exceeds the growth in regular wages. Basically, the value of a house goes up exponentially while minimum wage remains the same, that kind of thing. The rich get richer and the poor stay poor, possibly even grow poorer, because we also have to remember that we're dealing with a long-term decline of the middle class, which, if you remember what I said, I don't know, 30 seconds ago, for the working class, middle class is about as rich as they're going to get. So now that's even out of reach. So to give you a better idea of how this inequality shakes out in the United States, in our capitalist system here, the top 10% wealthiest people here in the US earn a living the way most of us do. They work for it at a job of some sort. But take that group even a little bit smaller to the top 0.1%. And there things are a lot different because the truly rich don't get their money by working for pay. They get their money as the result of their pre-existing wealth. See, they already had it, right? At the bottom of that spectrum, when we go down to the bottom 10%, even the bottom 50%, even probably the bottom 70%, wealth is typically negative as people have more in debt than they have in assets. So that means things like student loans, credit cards, mortgages, car payments, you name it. Anyone you're making a payment to every month for something that you bought a while ago, that's debt. That's why things like student loan forgiveness could be a huge boon to our economy and literally generations of people as, well, no one's going to get rich off of having their student loans forgiven. It will allow them to possibly own some true tangible assets down the road, guaranteeing them a more financially secure life for themselves and for you know their children. I have a lot of feelings about property, about the inequality that comes from that, as you can tell already, and we will actually be talking about that in the next episode. The next pillar of capitalism is supply and demand, which when we learned about capitalism, very limited, like I said, in economics in high school, we focused so much on supply and demand. That's like the one thing I think I learned. And supply and demand literally determine the price we pay for things. Supply is the amount of something available, and demand is basically how many people want it. If the good or service you're selling is in high demand, it's worth more, meaning people will pay more money for it. For example, if you want to buy land in the middle of nowhere, it's probably going to be pretty cheap because... It's not that close to many things like cultural stuff, shopping, schools, healthcare, all of that. So it's a little bit less desirable and kind of, you know, plentiful. But if you want to buy a place in, say, San Francisco, it's super desirable because it's a beautiful city with lots of stuff going on. So many people want to live there. So it's going to cost you a lot more for a lot less. From a retail perspective, if your volume of inventory, like the amount of stuff you have to sell, is larger than the number of people who want to buy it, well, it's not a good story for you. It's good for the customers, I guess. So if you have 1,000 shirts, but only 50 people want them, you're going to have to mark those shirts down to a bargain basement price to get 1,000 people interested in buying them. But if you have 50 shirts and 1,000 people want them, well, you can practically name your own price on those because they're like extra super desirable. And this is some way, I mean, just in my experience in retail, uh, sometimes retail sort of shoots itself in the foot because they'll get that one item where they only bought 50 and 1,000 people want it. And so they think, okay, let's make 10,000 of these. 
by the time the 10,000 shirts or whatever it is arrive, there aren't 10,000 people interested in it anymore because they've moved on to something else. And so then they're suddenly like, we have 10,000 and only 50 people want it. Let's sell it all for $9.99. This happens all the time. And it's one of the big gambles of being a buyer is knowing when is the right time to reorder something and when is the right time to walk away. And there's no easy answer there ever. It's just one of those things you know in your gut. When we look at the wild and irresponsible overproduction of clothing today, which I've talked about in the past, and don't worry, we'll be talking about more, we see that the supply of clothing will always exceed demand. It's wildly exceeding demand right now. And what does that mean? It means low, low prices and deals, deals, deals for all of us because these retailers know they're making more than they can sell. They need to try to sell every last unit to us to the best of their ability. Of course, they don't sell it. It ends up being burned, going to the landfill, but they're trying their darndest. I promise we'll talk about that a lot this month too. I promise we'll be talking about that more this month too because the overconsumption of fast fashion and just fashion in general has really turned the very classic, very desirable to high school economics teachers model of supply and demand kind of like upside down. Next is competition, which is often seen as the heart, perhaps the greatest value of capitalism, because competition breeds innovation, quality, prices, efficiency, all of that. But here's the caveat only if the supply doesn't exceed demand. So when we talk about fast fashion, there isn't a lot of innovation or better quality there. In fact, when I was just talking a few minutes ago about returns, you know, retailers have kind of abandoned both of those ideas because all of these retailers decided the thing that they were going to compete on was price, and they sort of raced one another to the bottom. Now everything's super cheap, and they're kind of stuck there overproducing and selling stuff for cheaper and cheaper. And I don't know how they get themselves out of this. This is one of those things you read about a lot in industry publications where it's just like, how do we fix it? How do we stop being the cheapest? Like, it's going to take everybody holding hands and saying they're not going to overproduce and sell tons of cheap shit. And I don't think they're going to do that. Anyway, we'll talk about that more this month, too. The next pillar of capitalism is freedom, and that's the one that libertarians really love. Freedom in a capitalist economy means that no one can tell you what to do in order to earn money, and no one can tell you how to spend it. But I would argue, and so would a lot of other people, that people living in poverty aren't really free to pursue their best lives and maximize their skills and income and do whatever they want because they're already locked into struggling to survive. And we'll also talk about freedom this month. Last is incentive. And incentive is the motivation to make more and more money to build a successful business, to innovate, to beat the competition, to live that dream. I would say greed is the incentive here. And you might hear the phrase, greed is good and cringe. I know I do. That's not a sentiment I support or agree with. But fans of capitalism think that's a very positive statement. For them, greed fuels competition, profit, and innovation. Lots of other things too. Which does benefit those who can afford to participate. But anti-capitalists will say that actually... Greed leads to exploitation of humans, disregard for the planet and its resources, and all around lack of consideration for the intellectual property of others, aka knockoffs. Sounds a lot like fast fashion, right? (laughs) Okay, well, what about socialism? Because I'm sure you've noticed that a lot of anti-capitalist conversations on social media always include socialism. And I also know that The right, the political right, likes to throw around socialism as a scare tactic. It's not scary. It's just different than capitalism. Before I explain socialism, let's just review capitalism again. It's characterized by private ownership of assets and businesses. A capitalist economy relies on free markets to determine price, incomes, wealth, and distribution of goods. And 
At its core, it really relies on inequality. It needs wealth disparity to function. And it has been completely full of inequality since its origins. The most Ardent supporters of capitalism want the government to stay out of business and let the competition of the free market solve problems. They believe the freedom is the key component to capitalism's success. Socialism is an economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. That's a lot of words. Totally got it from the dictionary. So how about this? Socialism requires greater government intervention and sort of social intervention to reallocate resources in a more egalitarian, equal way, meaning less inequality, less private property, less of a divide between the haves and the have-nots, mostly just instead of a few people who have a whole lot and a large group of people who have little, everybody just having about the same amount. Capitalism means major assets and companies are privately owned, while in socialism, these assets are owned by the government and community cooperatives. The implication there for people who are against socialism is that there's a lot less freedom involved. However, people who are pro-socialism, anti-capitalism will tell you that the freedom just seems to make everything go sideways. <laughs> humans, are, humans are greedy by nature. I'll just say that. Not all humans. Hashtag not all humans. But somehow the most successful ones tend to be in capitalism Income and wages are controlled by private business, and they basically dictate how much they want to pay for the labor of others. Socialism, on the other hand, seeks to close that income divide by redistributing the wealth of the economy and sort of leveling the playing field in terms of income. So once again, not a few people with tons of money and most people having very little money, everybody having just enough money. In capitalism, prices are controlled by the free market, while in socialism, the government controls the prices. So the conceit of capitalism is that all that competition, all of these companies competing for your money will mean that prices will remain fair, where socialism says, actually, you guys change the prices on things based on how much you, people want them. And it's not fair. We're going to say this is how much this thing is all the time. And a couple examples of the free market sort of capitalizing off of demand to the detriment of consumers. I have a couple here. One is airfare. Uh, the price of plane tickets is totally bizarro. And I've read so many articles about how to game the system and certain days of the week and times, best times to travel and on and on and on. But the reality is that Airlines know that the sooner your flight is, the more desperate you are for a ticket, the more you'll pay. They also know that certain events are more desirable than others, and so they will price accordingly around that, jacking up the price for a major event, the best travel season, etc. Another example, um, and I'm sure all of you who live in colder climates experience this, it's how your gas and oil heat gets more expensive in the winter. Conversely, I think that in some places, electricity becomes more expensive in the summer because of all that air conditioning. So those are a couple examples of how supply and demand change prices. Socialism says, no, the airline ticket's always going to be the same price. So is your heat. So is your electricity. A next major difference between socialism and capitalism is taxes, because capitalism in its purest form functions under this idea of minimal government just minimal government. <laughs> I was going to say minimal government intervention, but really just the least amount of government. And so therefore, less taxes. You don't need to pay as much money into the government if there's not very much government going on. And this is part of the Republican conservative platform. And that's why we've seen a lot of government defunding during the last administration, during the Bush administration. Definitely during the Reagan era, like to an extreme, totally reworked the way our government works. Well, socialism has a lot higher taxes because socialism is almost like 
maximum government, specifically the social safety net being just so much larger, more inclusive, and more comprehensive. And that includes healthcare and education, which have been privatized here in the United States and are, to be clear, a train wreck. <laughs> so right there, if, if you like to go to a doctor and not think to yourself, should I see a doctor or pay my rent, but actually be able to have both? You might be a fan of socialism, just saying. In a socialist economy, these industries, healthcare and education, and lots of other ones are controlled by the government. So they're more accessible and affordable to all people hence the higher taxes. I would love to hear from someone who lives in a more socialized economy like Canada or the UK. Please tell me, what is it like? Do you feel like you're broke because of your taxes? Or do you feel like the healthcare and the education more than make up for that? I would love to hear from you because in here in the United States, we pay a pretty decent amount of taxes. And I mean, you know, listen, I'm glad we have roads to drive on and all of that stuff. But like people go bankrupt when they get sick, people choose to die rather than getting health care. People can't finish school because they can't afford it. People live under crippling student loan debt that prevents them from doing anything with their lives. I think I'd rather pay higher taxes and just know that everyone was going to be cared for. The thing is, I know I'm making socialism sound really great, but like all isms, <laughs> neither of these systems are perfect. Probably because people are not perfect and consistent and reliable and some people get greedy and, you know, you know, all the people things, all the things that make us people. Sometimes they prevent some of these things from playing out to their best, most optimal goal, right? We know already, because we live in it, that capitalism leads to exploitation, a lack of concern for the greater good, monopolies, and really, really intense inequality. But socialism in its purest form is also not perfect. It often leads to inefficiencies within the system. And there's a lot less incentive for innovation because you don't have that greed driving people because everybody's going to make about the same amount of money. So why hustle super hard to invent something new or a better way of doing things? We'll be talking about this a lot more through the month, but I think that the best solution is a fusion of these two isms, socialism and capitalism, sort of taking the greatest strengths of both. It's called, well, some people call it this, social capitalism, which is kind of a dumb name. I think we need a name that is none of those words. I don't know, like we need a rebrand, but <laughs> social capitalism just what we're calling it until we come up with a better name, is a capitalist system that is structured with the ideology of liberty, equality, and justice. But instead of aiming to accumulate only like financial forms of capital, like our current capitalist system, so basically instead of stacking money as the end goal, it explicitly values all forms of capital. So that means social capital, human capital, and natural capital, like the resources around us, our beautiful, wild, and miraculous planet. This form of social capitalism, like I said, just a name we're holding on to until we rebrand it, it needs to have a much stronger social safety net that provides healthcare and full education for anyone who wants it, along with nice places to live, access to good food. I know you're laughing at me right now and saying, how is that even possible? But I'm going to tell you, it is possible. We'll be getting into this all throughout the month, but I think there is a way to re-envision our current system that isn't painful for most of us. Maybe it's a little painful for the super wealthy. It would be hard to wake up one day and be like, I'm not a billionaire anymore. But would it really, would it be harder to not be a billionaire anymore, but be comfortably wealthy than to not be able to afford a place to live? I'll let you discuss that on your own. Okay, well, I hopefully haven't bored you to death. So if you are asleep right now, please wake up. This is your wake up call so you can go meet Kelsey of Chaos Garner. And I've been talking for so long right now. I'm just going to jump right into this conversation. So let's go. All right. Well, Kelsey, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? 
Hi everyone, I'm Kelsey. I'm the owner and designer of clothing brand KS Garner. And KS Garner is a slow fashion clothing brand that's made to order and we focus on size inclusivity by offering extra extra small up to 4XX and custom sizing. That's amazing. Where do you live? I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, I knew this, but I'd sort of filed away for future reference. I was reminded this week that Arizona does not participate in daylight savings time. No. Nope. So, <laughs> so I had to do some quick uh, stuff on the calendar. It was literally like I was laying in bed and it was the first thing I thought of. And I was like, shit, I don't think that updated <laughs> because she doesn't have daylight savings time. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it still confuses me because I grew up in Utah. And when I moved here, I was like, well, this is strange. What, you guys are on your own level over here. <laughs> It's pretty weird because it's it is. the only place, right? So when you're even on a road trip, it gets kind of confusing oh, and strange. Yeah. Um, and I just had like our calendar in like mountain time, like the yep. time zone you're in. But then I was like, oh, that's right. Arizona has its own like special sub zone. Oh, yeah. Because they're, they're rule breakers over there. Oh, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you describe your own personal style? My personal style is very eclectic and very whimsical. Um, day to day is very different. And I feel like that's how I design too. Some days I can be very mod or some days I can be very retro, very cottage core. It just, it depends on my mood. So it's different day to day. <laughs> oh, same for me. I'm all over the place. Me too. It is crazy. <laughs> you obviously love style. You love clothes. You obviously use clothing as a personal expression. Did you always plan that you were going to start your own brand? and be a fashion designer slash company? No. Uh, when I was younger, I always liked to sketch clothes just for fun, but I don't think I ever thought of it like as a career. And mm -hmm. my grandma is an avid sewer. She had different businesses when she was younger, but I never wanted to learn. Um, soccer was my life growing up. And then when I came out to Arizona, I met a teacher when I was um, touring MCC, the community college, and she was a fashion teacher. And I was like, hey, this is cool. I like fashion. Maybe I'll just like dip my toes into it. And right. then I was fully immersed and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> what was your journey to starting your own brand? Did you work for someone else before that and kind of get motivated? Or was it just like, I'm going to start right out of the gate doing my own thing? So when I was in school, my main goal, I was doing fashion merchandising and I wanted to be a buyer, vastly mm -hmm. different than what I'm doing now. And yes, <laughs> I kind of learned more about it. And I was like, no, I don't think that's my style. Like I like design. I like to be more creative and flow mm -hmm. a little bit differently than what a buyer does. Um, and in the beginning, I was costuming and styling for music videos for local bands in Phoenix. And I didn't have yeah. necessarily like a brand like it is now. Um, the brand started maybe about six years ago and I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a brand. I'm going to sell stuff online and I'll see how it goes. Like I didn't have a plan to be where I'm at today. <laughs> right. Right. So what happened next? I liked designing like collections. I like, I like doing cohesive collections and seeing how I can put different colors together and patterns. And so I was like, I'm just going to release eight pieces and I'm going to see how it goes. And I did men's and women at that time. And oh, wow, that is a lot. Yeah. Oh, it was so much. And I loved doing both. It was a lot of fun. And then I ended up adding kids at some point. And whoa, I, yeah, it was crazy. I was like, what am I doing? This is too much. And so <laughs> I took it most of it away. And then I just started doing women's for the most part. And I was like, okay, I got Come this. On. I would love to add kids and men eventually, but I'd have to have more employees at that point. <laughs> oh, for sure. That is a lot. And that's why like so many massive brands don't even do all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot for sure. Right. So what challenges have you faced along the way as you've built your business? I'm sure it wasn't just like the seamless thing where everything has been great and there were never any problems. Yeah. it's. I think the biggest thing is funding because everything's been self-funded. Mm -hmm. And Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and I wanted to do manufacturing for a little while because I thought that's the best way to – that was just – this was years ago before I knew anything else. And I was like, that's the best way to grow. <laughs> and then right. I realized how much it was and uh -huh. how I wouldn't be able to do the size range that I have because I didn't have the money to do that. And I was like, no, I don't think that's the route for me. So I'm just going to stay in-house. We'll be made to order. 
So at that point, it seemed like there's no way I could make it. But now I'm happy that I chose that route because so many more brands are choosing to be that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you would bring up the manufacturing angle because I have seen in the last few years a lot of smaller brands sort of trying to take that on. Basically like saying like how I'm going to fund my own label is by making private label for other companies. And Mm -hmm. I've definitely been approached by different brands to do that of various jobs I've had where, you know, they could make anything for us. But it does seem like... Yes, I guess at the end of the day, it could make you more money, but it's so expensive to get started and it's really risky. Yeah. Especially like in the era of COVID with so many brands canceling orders. Oh, right. I mean, like, I think you made the right decision even if you 100% didn't see everything that was coming down the line. Yeah. it's. I think the hardest thing has been scaling as a made-to-order brand. Like, that's something that's been very interesting to figure out. I recently, within the past year, before that, I was just me. And then I hired two seamstresses, luckily. I, but I was scared. I was like, I don't know what to do. Does anyone like sew as contract sewers anymore? Am I going to mm-hmm. have to do like manufacturing? But luckily, I was able to find two ladies in the Valley that can work from home. So I was able to scale and not be too scared about everything that was incoming and having to do it by myself. Your entire brand is made to order, right? So like someone, if they order something that is when it's going to be sewn, right? Yes, online. And then if I do markets, I'll do like small batches of things. But everything else, if I have any wholesale orders, it's all made to order. Wow. I mean, that's the smartest thing to do, though. You know, it's right. like the safest. Um, and do you find that customers are sort of turned off by that? Or are they like, no, this is great because, you know, it feels like it has more integrity, sort of? Yeah, I feel like it's about 80-20. Like 80% of people love it because – Not everyone's got the same body type or height. And so hems can Mm -hmm. be adjusted. And if you don't fit within my size guide, we can make it to your body type. So I feel like a lot of people like it. But then there's also the people that maybe don't read through the entire listing. And they're like, messaging me like a week (laughs) later. And they're like, where's my thing? I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. It takes five to six weeks to make. And then I feel so bad. I'm like, oh, great. They're going to be so mad at me. (laughs) That is classic, though. I feel like, <laughs> yeah, like people not reading listings is like the American way. Oh my gosh, point. I know. <laughs> and I'm like so detailed, like probably too much. And I'm like, I promise you, I put everything in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, what have you learned so far that you would have never guessed? I think it is how fulfilling it is. Like, obviously, I think everyone thinks being self employed is amazing and it's the dream and it is it's so much fun I just didn't expect it to be fulfilling in the way that it is like getting orders to this day makes me feel so happy like someone likes what I do someone appreciates the (laughs) work I put into this and just the extent of happiness that it would give me and obviously gives a lot of stress too but just it's there's nothing like being self-employed and making clothes for people that make them feel happy and make them feel seen what is your day to day like? Oh boy, it's so different from today. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, I, I don't bet, even know. I it's bet. crazy. I <laughs> for a while there, I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a plan. Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, every week will be the same. And then so fast that went out the window because I was like, no, things get thrown at you all the time. Like I cannot keep to a schedule. So it's very different. Most of the time, I wake up to emails. I just try to get that out of the way because that's very overwhelming to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the emails are oh. like more of a time suck than you think they're going to be. You know, I remember when I – even when I interviewed for my first buying job and I really didn't know what buying was or what you did, I remember asking the person who interviewed me like what the job would be and she said a lot of emails. Yep. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I see that now. <laughs> yeah. I know. I think that's what I didn't expect is like just emails from all over the place, not just from customers, but like from interviews and people wanting to – work on your website. I'm like, I can't even think about it. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet you do get a lot of those. And then like, do you have a lot of people working with you for you or are you wearing a lot of hats? I'm wearing a lot of hats. I have the two seamstresses who have saved my life this past year. It's just been so helpful. And then for a while there, I was having one of my friends do shipping fulfillment um, mm-hmm. just when it got like super busy and I couldn't handle it all. And then I am working with a PR company now, so they're handling some of like the ads and marketing and stuff. But other than that, all the other hats are on my head. (laughs) 
Yeah, I bet. So you're like dealing with social media, yeah, which is like more of a time suck than anyone would ever guess until they have to start doing it. Oh yeah, and you know, you're I'm sure you're dealing with customer emails and like you have to like make sure production's on track. I mean, that is a lot. Oh, and you have to do like you know manage the money. Yeah, and everything else. <laughs> I know. And sometimes I'm like, it would be so much better if I had help. Like I'm sure I would be more efficient, but it's just it's hard to figure out where to delegate these things. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. I mean, that is like such a common conversation, you know, and also like the budget for delegating stuff. Right? Exactly. Because, you know, then you have to sell more stuff to pay more people. And it, it's it's kind of like this weird cycle. You have to like get over the weird hump. Oh, yeah. Where like, okay, now you're making enough money to do that, but you can't do it too soon. It's it's just, it's really, really hard. So you aren't actually, do you actually still sew stuff or your two helpers are handling that? No, I do still sew stuff. For a while there, when COVID happened and masks were crazy, I, it was like me and my two seamstresses were 40 to 50 hours a week. Like we, none of us could stop working and it was pretty crazy. And but <sighs> luckily- yeah. We've luckily gotten ahead of things now and it's been a little bit easier for me to step back and do just emails one day and do like photo shoot styling reels one day. So I do have more time, which makes me so much happier. (laughs) Yeah, I bet. I bet. I mean, it's man, the thought of sewing masks too for like 50 hours a week. Oh yeah. It's not the most exciting project. Wow. Oh, Oh no, it was so monotonous. And at some point I'm like, I'm not creative at all. That's the part I miss is I don't feel like I'm being creative. (laughs) I mean, I think that's a really common problem because, you know, you get like held up like with all this other stuff that is part of running a business but is not creative at all. And then it's like, when do I have time to actually do the thing that I love that made me do all this in the first place? That's a really challenging balance. Oh, yeah, for sure. And so sometimes if I'm in like the middle of sewing an order and I have a design idea, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to design and sketch it down because it'll make me feel like I kind of reboosted that creativity, even though I'm not making it yet. I'm kind of taking a break. I'm like, okay, write it down. Let's figure out colors. (laughs) When I came across your brand, it was so funny because I'd already started following you on Instagram and was like thinking about reaching out to you. And then you reached out to me and I was like, how did this happen? (laughs) This is like such a weird miracle because what caught my eye specifically is like, you don't or at least I would say currently for the most part, when we think about slow fashion, when we think about like sustainably made, ethically made stuff, we have a vision of what that looks like. And it's a lot of like linen mm-hmm. and like solids yep. and like earth tones. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Like basically oh, yeah. that has been not like 100% of all ethical and, and sustainable brands have been that way, but the um, vast majority of them for this century have been in that realm. And so it's kind of given ethical fashion sort of like a bad name. Like if you're not a really thin, wealthy white woman who loves a big gauzy moo moo, mm-hmm. then we don't have anything for you. Right. Exactly. And I saw your line and I was like, Oh my God. It's like, look at all the different sized people she's dressing. And they're all like such major babes. And this is like, this is a lot more like fun. Yeah. And I, I don't want to call it trendy because that's not the right term either because it's very timeless and like vintage inspired, but it's a lot more whimsical and fun than what we expect from ethical fashion in 2021. Like it has – it just seems more appealing maybe to like a younger person as well. And then on top of that, to be fitting all these different sizes of people and actually showing that – in your social media is so unusual. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, I have to reach out to this person. Oh, but then you, you emailed me first. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It's it was fate. Like <laughs> totally fate. So well, let's talk about your line because obviously the values around it were what like really surprised me, I guess. I was like, this is too cute to be this great, you know? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what are your driving values for your brand? Size inclusive, I would say, is the first biggest value for me. And the reason behind that, I started being size inclusive maybe five years ago before the big boom of it. And it was Mm -hmm. because of my own journey. I struggled with an eating disorder for five years. And then I struggled with alcohol addiction for like six or seven years. And that was for issues with my own body and issues of the past and not liking myself. And so when I started my brand, I was like, I need a brand that is going to cater to younger Kelsey, 
what would she would have wanted to see? Like, yeah. yeah. And so I was like, I need all bodies. I need people that are confident and happy in clothes that make them happy and everyone can buy it. I'm not excluding anyone. So it was mostly for my own story and trying to help me and younger me. <laughs> um, and then yeah. sustainably made and ethically made is my, I would say, second biggest value. And being able to employ people here in Phoenix is so nice and paying seamstresses a living wage, paying myself a living wage when I have to sew um, and being made to order. Like when I started that, I didn't know much about slow fashion or ethical fashion. It was just because it was the most cost effective for me and it made sense. So I was like, <laughs> I mean, it works out. <laughs> I, know. It is, I mean, that's right there. That says a lot because I think, you know, one of the things that I hear the most is like, well, it's really expensive to make slow fashion, to make like ethical fashion. And that's why there's so much fast fashion. And I'm like, uh, that's not exactly true. Because when I look at the prices on your website too, like they're more affordable than say, you know, like anthropology yeah. or even made well in many situations. And those are both fast fashion brands. Yeah. Price isn't the only hang up that people seem to think exists. The other one is like, well, it's really hard for slow fashion to make more sizes. And I hate that. I hate that ethical fashion right now for the most part ends at a, at a very small size, large, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And I think you're proving that you can do both. Like, have you found that actually being size inclusive is really challenging to your business model? No, I don't think so. I think there was a learning curve for me for a while because I also do all the pattern making and the pattern grading. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for a while, I'd, I just would make the size small and then pattern grade up from there infinitely. But you can't do that. It doesn't work like that. Right. No. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah. And so I feel like that was the biggest learning curve for me. And so that was like um, hanging out with my friends and like learning from them. Like what's your biggest challenges with fitting um, and all different size of friends and then doing fittings with them and learning as I go like, okay, you don't just add a quarter inch every single size on length because people don't just continually get tall. <laughs> no. And their arms don't get like longer yeah. and longer. <laughs> I definitely like at different points in my career when I've been trying to develop product in extended sizes with like re vendors who don't normally do that. The first sample we get is always really bizarre. It's made for someone like who's like six, five yeah. and whose arms go down to their knees. <laughs> It's hilarious. <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, there's just so there's just like not education around it. It's right. really frustrating. I was I was listening to a podcast that I I love this morning called Maintenance Phase, and it kind of like debunks all of these like diet and wellness and just nonsense bullshit that's out there. And uh, today that was actually about Weight Watchers and how Weight Watchers has been. I mean, its business has ups and downs, but it's been like a cash cow like, for a long time yeah. because people forget that like take the ugliness of diet culture out of this in general retailers act like large people don't have money to spend. And actually it's such a huge market that I don't understand why they don't see that and like make yeah. the clothes, you know? Right. That's what <laughs> I don't understand either because for me it's been nice. And I feel like when a plus size person finds a brand, they're going to tell all their friends because it's so rare to find a size inclusive brand. So it just works out. And it's like, why not just put the money and effort into it? Because you will make your money back and you'll get that many more customers. Yeah, I just don't get it. I mean, even, you know, one part of my career, I was working for Mod Cloth and we were really trying to get more and more of our like manufacturing partners to do extended sizes for us because ultimately that was where the money was for our business. Yeah. Like, that was what was allowing the company to grow in a time where it, the business had been around for so long. It had kindly kind of reached every like, you know, straight size customer out there. There was no more growth there. Like if they wanted to continue to grow, they had to like, you know, really think outside of that. Yeah. And every vendor that I tried to onboard was just like so difficult about it. And they were like, it's so risky, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't think you realize that like this is an investment yeah. because this is going to pay for itself 10 times over. Right. Like you, this whole market of people is like ignored for some reason. Yeah, I know. You know. And it just seems like you can make different judgment calls like, okay, we'll take away one silhouette and then we can add four sizes to the other silhouettes. Like it seems like you can do it and you can maneuver. It's just mm -hmm. how much do they want to obviously. <laughs>
Yeah. I mean, this is something we talk about time and time again here on the show, which is like people who are, say, smaller than a size 12 or 14 and are not, you know, petite, are of average height, if you will, uh, those people have almost too many shopping options. Yeah. And every retailer is pandering to that person. And that's why they're kind of like driving one another out of business. And even if just one of them would say, hey, let's let's dress some more people, they would probably see their business take off. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. It's so ridiculous. I know. It's been fascinating to me to watch. It's like, me as a small brand, if I can do it, I think that th- they can do it. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so you've already explained why size inclusivity is so important to you. And, you know, you also talked about like sustainability and ethical, you know, business practices, manufacturing and whatnot. How do you sort of live those values in your own personal life? For me, I think the biggest thing is purchasing less, purchasing from small businesses, ethical businesses, just not buying as many material things. Like I feel like for so long, just along with my other addictions, like shopping was a huge thing and I like to buy things and made me feel better. And it's like once I recovered from my eating disorder and I became sober from alcohol, it's like I don't need those things. Like I can just be fulfilled in life without those things. And so I feel like it's mostly that just realizing these things are going to be a temporary feeling. So you don't need to buy them. And actually really thinking about a purchase, like no no impulse buying, thinking about it for an hour or a day. Like, do I need this? Is this necessary to my life? Do I have this in my closet? Do I have this in my pantry? Um, So that's, that's a big way. And then purchasing different items for the home that's more sustainable, um, bamboo products, no plastic. And then Gardening is very big for me and my family and chickens. And so trying to be (laughs) self-sustaining through our food and the way we live, um, obviously buying local from ourselves. I don't know how you say that. Not buying local, but like you know what's going into your food. And Mm -hmm. I think the same feeling of like buying a material object, I get that same feeling from gardening, but it lasts so much longer, like to put this work and effort into this food that you're growing and then to be able to eat it. So that's, for me, that's like how I live sustainably is through those practices. What's your favorite thing to grow in your garden? Like what have you had the most success with? Because I'm assuming in Arizona, the gardening situation is a lot different than it is here where I live in Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's very different because of the heat and the cold My favorite thing is cabbage, which is usually more of a winter thing, but I love growing cabbage. Mm -hmm. It grows so big and it's so tasty from your garden. (laughs) It's true. It's like totally different. Like if you think you don't like cabbage, either grow your own or buy some that was grown locally. And it's like, oh my God, like uh, I'm definitely planting some cabbage this year, but I bought a Napa cabbage in early fall from like the Amish farmers and I was like, I could just sit and eat this head of cabbage just like oh, chips yeah. right now. Like it's <laughs> so good, you know? Um, it, I, I do think that is so – that's such an interesting thing to think about how what we think of as different fruits and vegetables mm-hmm. are so distanced from what they really are when you grow them yourself. Yeah. Like just the taste, the texture, the size, the appearance – Um, I was watching this episode of 90 Day Fiance (laughs) and there uh, one of the uh, fiancés came from Russia or the Ukraine and the male fiancé took her to the grocery store and she was like, these are apples. Why do they look so unnatural? And I was like, you're right. Right. Fruit at the grocery store especially is so weird. Yeah. Why is it so (laughs) giant? (laughs) Yeah. And like kind of flavorless really when you get into it. Um, Yeah. I think gardening is such a... It's, I, I feel like I hear this from a lot of different people in the community, how gardening has been so good for their mental health. Oh, yeah. It's really helped them in their recovery from all kinds of different addictions. And I think it's interesting how you can see very clearly the connection between your eating disorder, your alcohol addiction, and shopping, yeah. how they are all so related. And I think it's true. And those are actually three, I don't know, conditions mm-hmm. that – are like sort of like socially acceptable to have. Yeah, you know what I for mean? For sure. It's it's always so weird to me when like office parties have lots of alcohol and there's like a lot of pressure to drink yeah. it. And like, you know, 
I've worked places where they sent out like weird bikini diets and stuff to everyone. I had one job where they literally had a biggest loser competition. Ugh. And, you know, yeah. like, like I feel like people are like, oh, urging people to control their food compulsively and like eat less and lose weight is totally socially acceptable. Drinking all the time is. And of course, you know, retail therapy is something that like people throw around as if it's a real treat. Right. Yeah. It's, I feel like the hardest thing for me was probably recovering from alcohol addiction because it is so accessible and it is pushed in your face constantly. Like I almost think it's harder to recover than a hard drug because I can go to the grocery store. I can go to the gas station and all your friends do it. And drinking too much is okay. Like we have the hangover hamburger. Like it just is so ingrained (laughs) in our culture. It makes it so difficult to get over It is. It is. You know, I became really sensitive to it a few years ago when someone I was very close to was really struggling with alcohol addiction. And I felt like no one else in our larger social circle was being sensitive to it at all. Like, why would you ask this guy to come and meet you at a bar? Right. Why would you invite this guy to a party where everyone's wasted? And he like worked in an office in advertising where people were just drinking constantly all day. There's like booze in the kitchen constantly. Yeah. And I was like, how is he going to recover from this? Yeah. You know, like imagine if you went to the office and everybody was offering you Oxycontin right. <laughs> for like an all hands meeting, you know, like that would never happen. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing about it. I am so lucky that I didn't have that. Like everyone was super supportive of me, but that's the thing is people don't take it seriously. They're like, oh, you drink too much. That's fine. I'm like, no, it's not fine. It's a like addiction. Isn't just one version of someone like it's a sliding scale. You can drink too much and still be addicted to it in a certain way. Like it's, there's so many versions of it. (laughs) Totally. Totally. I'm, and the same thing with eating disorders. I think everybody has this one vision of what an eating disorder is and like who that person is. And it's like, no, actually it's so much more complicated. I've been really, obsessed lately with how all of these like fad diets and like wellness trends are really just a springboard for eating disorders. And I just, I'm like, I hate diet culture more than ever. Diet culture is such a major part of capitalism Mm -hmm. as is really alcohol. When you see it all, like then shopping, put that in there. Like if you're having a bad day, go buy something. And you can see that like, there are all of these sort of like socially acceptable addictions that we, we need to all recognize and support one another in recovering. From. Exactly. And just be more open about it and also be open to listening about it and not telling someone that their problems aren't real. Oh, seriously. <laughs> or it could be worse. Yes. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a classic one. Yeah, it doesn't help anyone. Well, you know, it's not like you lost your job no. or, or got a DUI or anything. Yeah. And you're like, dude, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I, I agree. But I, I do think that all of this like addictive behavior is so connected and it's so much more common than most people would think that if you step back and say, okay, I'm realizing that I have issues with shopping, for example, often you start to see when you peel back those layers, hopefully with the help of a therapist, that there are other things that you're struggling with too, yeah. you know, and, and like treating it, all of it has to be treated, not just like one facet of it. Right. Um, so I think it's really exciting that you have taken your struggles and channeled them into this amazing brand. I mean, you must be so proud. Yeah. Especially. So Wednesday is my three year sober mark. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank, thank you. And every time it comes around, I really like to praise myself and feel good and pat myself on the back because if I think about before three years ago, like there's no way I would be where I'm at now. So I'm so grateful with what I've done with the brand and really turned my life around. And that's why I'm super open with it on social media because I just hope to help others and see that addiction, eating disorders, there's not a face for it. No. Like it looks different for everyone. And I want people to feel open to talk to me about it and know that it's a real thing. And so I, I just, I'm super open with it and I hope that it helps someone else. I think so. I have been really, really encouraging everyone, you yelling about it a lot on Instagram. Like we need to be, we, I think that we have been conditioned over the past few years, maybe the past decade since Instagram really came up that our social media is for showcasing all of the good things in our lives. And I think that that actually 
affects everyone else's mental health poorly, that we feel like we have to put a positive spin on everything that happens. And I think it can be really incredible for both yourself and the people in your life to say, hey, things suck right now. Here's what's going on. You know, or guess what? I've been sober three years. Like this is a miracle. Here's how I got here. You know, like I think, yeah. I think being sharing our true selves on social media is kind of like the most revolutionary idea right now because Instagram has become a place where people sell stuff and influencers are, you know, and yeah. <laughs> like what, right. if, what if we kind of like took it back and we're like, no, remember when Instagram was where you saw pictures of your friends and had inside jokes yeah. and saw what they were doing instead of just like, <laughs> here I am with my flawless avocado co- toast. Yep. You know, like I think I'm really excited by this idea of us like taking it over. <laughs> yeah, me too. And I feel like it's super helpful for me too. Like I know I'm helping others, but it's also helpful for me to share. And I feel like that's been the biggest struggle with social media is learning like, okay, I'm a brand. I'm supposed to be like a certain amount of professional, but I've also like thrown up that out the window. It's like, I'm going to do what <laughs> I want to do. <laughs> like I'm going to share stuff because people like to connect with the brand and I am the brand. So I want people to know me and who's behind the brand. Totally. I agree. That's the advice I give everybody who asks me about that. I'm like, you are the brand, be your true self because yeah. we really want to blend in with Nike and you know Zara and all these other like super polished corporations that like aren't cool and don't do things right. No, you want to, you want to showcase why you are special and unique, you know? And yeah, I, exactly. I love that. It's like bring the honesty back to our existences, I guess, you know? For sure. Yeah. And I feel like that's why I, I like being a small business because I don't have to answer to anyone. Like I don't have to say to my PR manager, like, don't say this. I'm like, I don't have to answer to anyone. Like, I'm going to say what I want and I'm going to be open. (laughs) I think that's really, really cool. So what's like the coolest thing that's happened so far as you've worked on the brand? Like, I feel like everybody has that one moment where they're like, oh my God, things are going the right way, you know? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I think, um, Dressing different musicians has been my favorite thing. Like pe- musicians buying stuff and seeing it on stage. It's just the coolest thing for me. I bet. I, I When I was talking about the costuming for music videos, I've costumed and styled for MB Alexander. It's a local band. And seeing that in a music video and on stage is just so surreal. Like I put my hands on that. <laughs> I made that. It's on stage. It's so awesome. So I think the musicians has been really cool. Um, I sent an outfit to Laura Leasy of Cronobin and... Courtney Marie Andrews, Pearl Charles, like just seeing that is like, they like my stuff and I like their stuff. And this mutual appreciation is so amazing to me. I love that. I think that is so cool. And it's just like artists supporting artists, you know? Yeah. Um, I would way rather see that than like see, you know, like a celebrity wearing something from like Zara or something. You know, I think it's like so much more meaningful. Or like from a big, like, I don't really care if someone's wearing Gucci or something. Like that's not interesting to me. I'd much rather see something cool and unique and made by like, Uh, like someone who's like a growing, you know, small business, like that is so much cooler to me. But like, yeah, it stands out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I also like think luxury is really uncool anyway. So um, I know I don't want any luxury items. Yeah, I've never even been interested. Even if I had a lot of money, I wouldn't buy it. It's just like not interesting to me. Um, Like, what are your creative inspirations? Because I know like stylistically, you're taking in all kinds of ideas from all over the place. Cause even looking at your, like your collections, you've got like velvet and you've got like mod florals and like all kinds of bright, amazing colors and ruffles. Like, I guess overall your style of inspiration is very like girly, if you will, but like for sure. Yeah. What outside of like clothing inspires you creatively? I think traveling has always been one of my biggest things. Like, I've done, I haven't done a bunch of traveling outside of the U S but I went to Italy a few years ago and just seeing everyone's different style is super inspiring. And even the landscape, like doing road Mm -hmm. trips. And I am from the West coast and I love the West so much. And just the desert landscape and the Mm -hmm. ocean is so inspiring to me to make outfits for those situations. Like, Oh, I'm going to go on a beach trip. I want a fun, loud outfit that fits that situation. And small other small businesses are super inspiring, 
But for me, that can be a slightly slippery slope because you don't want to be too inspired by another business where you're making something like way too similar. So Mm -hmm, it's like trying mm -hmm. to figure out those inspirations. Um, But I'm also inspired by different fashion brands. Rodart has been one of my favorites forever because I like how frilly and fun Mm -hmm. and girly. Oh my gosh, me too, (laughs) me too. (laughs) And then I, I really like Chromat. They have like changed the runway world for being mm-hmm. super size inclusive. And I love their colors, their silhouettes. The other really big thing is perfume commercials. I don't know why, but there's something about perfume wow. commercials. <laughs> I mean, they are, you know, I, I guess I don't see a lot of commercials anymore, but I do remember seeing them a lot and they always felt different than anything else that's on television. Like yeah. very, like they create a mood. They were like that like Tumblr mood aesthetic before Tumblr, I feel like. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have like a personal favorite ma- uh, perfume commercial? <laughs> one of my favorites recently is one with uh, Florence and the Machine. And I can't remember if it's Gucci or Dolce & Gabbana. But the reason I love it is because you – if you just looked at it with not seeing any titles, you have no idea what they're selling. And I love that. It's like, it's just art in itself and you don't know what they're selling you, but it's just beautiful. It's true. I have noticed that with a lot of perfume commercials that like, you don't know until the end that it's a commercial for perfume at all. Right. And it's just like, sometimes they're really sexy or sometimes they're really like visual, but it's always just, it's like, I mean, I th- I would love to someday do an episode just on perfume because, like, the actual contents of a perfume bottle cost, like, pennies, but yet you're yeah. selling this idea, you know? And so it makes right. sense that perfume commercials are so just, like, aesthetic, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> selling you the idea of, like, the mood exactly. of that perfume. Um, so I think, I think that's a really cool thing to be inspired by. I mean, do you – personally like perfume a lot or are you like an anti-perfume person I wear it here and there but I'm not huge on it and the more I learn about like the different chemicals and Mm -hmm. how it messes with your hormones like I kind of stink sticking away from it so I like it in the allure (laughs) of the beauty of it (laughs) yeah yeah I agree and I feel like the packaging is always really interesting and like design forward and I feel like people like the companies they put so much like time and attention to detail into creating like the packaging and the commercials and all the marketing but then like the product itself is usually stinky <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it's always kind of disappointing um well what are your dreams for the future of your business and you I mean you are the business you are the brand what would you love to see happen I would like to bring more items to the brand maybe not necessarily that I make like jewelry from another small business and bags and accessories. Like I I like to bring more into it where I necessarily don't have to make it because I just feel like that's too much to take on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I really want grant brand growth and to be able to hire more people because it makes me feel happy that I can sustain myself and also sustain someone else by hiring them. Mm -hmm, I agree. That's got to be a good feeling. Yeah. Oh, it is for sure. Especially within this pandemic, I was so happy that I could hire two people. Like I could, would never have thought I would be able to do that. So I was very happy about that. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, what are you working on next? Do you have any cool stuff coming up? I have a bell bottom collection that I Ooh. actually didn't plan until about a month ago. I posted a picture of these bell bottoms just like on my sewing table, and I thought it was so just like my messy studio. And I just said. I've gotten these custom orders for bell bottoms. Does anyone want to see more? And I got so many responses that I didn't think I would. So I was like, okay, I guess we're going to make a bell bottom collection. (laughs) I'm excited about this because I just got some roller skates and I was like wishing I had some bell bottoms to wear with them because the only ones I have are like black. It's just not the same. I need like a fun (laughs) pair. So I can't wait to see that. You've obviously tried to like minimize the plastic in your life. And this is something that I've been working really hard on a personal level to do too. But it's really intimidating if you haven't started to make that shift away and try new products and kind of scale out what you buy. Um, do you have any suggestions for like products or just doesn't even have to be a specific brand, but things that you actually thought found were a pretty easy shift for you? Yeah, I think that toilet paper, not packaged in plastic and toothpaste Mm -hmm. in an aluminum tube. And I, there's a website I found called package free shop and they kind of just have it all in one, which has been super easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great one. They have, and they have like everything. 
Yeah, which makes it so nice. It's like, and I, I do wait until my other items are out until I buy new ones. Cause I don't think you should sh- throw stuff away before it's done because that's also super wasteful. Like use what you have. And then once you're done with it, then you can start using the plastic free and more eco-friendly version totally. of it. Totally. I mean, that is a really good call out because I think some people, you know, you're eager to make that change. So you just go home, yeah. clear out the whole bathroom and replace it. And that definitely goes totally against the entire meaning of shifting away and reducing your waste. Um, I also have found that a lot of the plastic-free packaging, I feel, allows me to actually use every last bit of everything, whereas yeah. plastic kind of was like standing in the way of – like toothpaste I specifically think of when you start yeah. using the metal tube. But you can get – I swear you could make a tube of toothpaste last a whole year. I feel oh, like for sure. the one I'm working on is going to last a year. And that's wild because I got a special buy one, get one deal on it. So I've now got two <laughs> two years of toothpaste. Not everything is going to work for you in the first try. And also when you start to get into like the no plastic packaging in your house m- mindset, you start seeing plastic everywhere. Like why is there a little plastic window in the spaghetti box? Right. It's right? Ev- it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. It will make you lose your mind and like for us in our house when I first started being really conscious of this I felt like at least at that point it was a lot easier to go buy bulk and bring your own bags but right now during the pandemic it's not and so when the pandemic started and we couldn't just like throw stuff in our own bags again I I was already so anxious about the pandemic and everything else going on but the plastic was like pushing me over the edge it was like I was obsessing over it because it felt more controllable to me than like yes. everything else going on. And I just kind of had to like be like, you know what? We want pasta. We're going to have to buy it with a dumb plastic window. I don't know why right? it's on there. <laughs> right? We need to tell people that we don't need to see the plastic through. We don't need to see the pasta through the box. Right. I know what spaghetti looks like. <laughs> exactly. You know? <laughs> but I do think like, you know, there are some things you're going to try that work out really well right out of the gate. And then others are not. Like I've been – through the circuit of plastic-free deodorants, and a lot of them gave me a rash. Mm -hmm. Uh, I finally found one that I like, but that's like a – everybody's got a different thing with the deodorant. Uh, I tried – when we made the shift to shampoo and conditioner bars, which was a big move for us because my husband and I have – we have a lot of hair. And it was just (laughs) like the amount of conditioner bottles alone that we were putting in recycling was kind of appalling. And I was like, okay, we have to make the switch. And the first round of stuff we bought was so bad. Oh, yeah. I My hair was just like just one big tangle. And so then I was like beating myself up because I had to buy a plastic bottle of detangler. And I was like, I'm ruining everything. I'm so bad at this. Why am I such a failure? You know, if I really cared, I'd cut off all my hair or something, you know, like all these crazy angles. And so just accept that, like, be easy on yourself. Some things are going to work. Some things are not. There's a lot of trial and error. Uh, You're going to get there. You can't expect to, like, decide tomorrow that it's the first day of, like, a 100% plastic-free lifestyle when you haven't been in that lifestyle today, you know? (laughs) Right. Yeah. It's a learning curve, just like everything else. And that's okay. Like you'll learn plastic is in pretty much anything and you'll change where you can. And it's also listening to other people and what they've tried to, or like you can search the internet about that shampoo bar, conditioner bar and see if it works Mm -hmm. for them too. Cause Mm -hmm. like not every sustainable eco-friendly product is going to work. It's just not how it is. (laughs) Yeah. Unfortunately, just like every product in plastic isn't a guaranteed winner. Yes. It's the same thing without it, without it. It's it for sure. And you and I were talking earlier about how crazy it is that Target has all of this plastic free stuff right yes. now. Like I I can't believe it. It like it made me cry when I saw the like 10 kinds of plastic free deodorant. It was like yes. shelves and shelves where I just felt like pl- the idea of plastic free living, reducing your plastic waste like a year or two ago was like super radical. Yeah. Like only for like the hardest hippies, right? Right. <laughs> and like if you tried to talk to like your parents about it, like most parents, they would be like, what? What? Why? How, how right. would your deodorant stay in a package if it wasn't <laughs> plastic? And it, it for me is like it, it, it makes me feel really optimistic that if enough people push for all of these other changes in terms of consumption and – 
living wages and better quality products and all of these other things that it could really happen because shifting out of plastic is a major, it was like one of those things that a couple of years ago that every major manufacturer was like, no, nope, there's no way it's oh, right. happening. This is where we are. Accept it. Yeah. Like, and now it's a target for like average people. Right. And I feel like if it becomes more normal where there's not even a product with plastic, then no one would even know the difference to people that don't even do the research. So that's what would yeah. become so nice. <laughs> if the pasta came in a box and you couldn't see it inside, you wouldn't even think about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I do I do feel excited that like if we can continue to like grow our community and band together, we can actually make some really wild changes. For sure. I Yeah. Spreading the knowledge and spreading all the companies that you find, like, oh, I found this new eco-friendly poly mailer, like sh- sharing the company with others so that they know as well, like not taking all this knowledge and just keeping it to yourself. Like, I only want to know this because I found them. It's like, no, let's, let's share it. <laughs> Right, right. And like that is like, man, that line of thinking, I think it's like actually probably just like really basic human nature to be like, I found the poly bag mailer or this great fabric supplier or something and like I'm never going to tell anyone else. But like that doesn't – like sharing all of this information is what helps us make the world better. Like let's support our fellow small businesses so that like we can take down the big, ugly, stupid – corporations. You exactly. Know, like, yeah. Yeah. And so I I have been thinking a long time about how it would be really great for all of the small makers on Instagram. I specifically target Instagram because I feel like that is where our community lives now. And combining forces and being like, okay, we're going to buy a pallet of these compostable mailers so we can all afford it. Yes. We're going to go in on it. Or we're going to like, you know, we're going to decide like all of us need this kind of fabric and we need this much as a group. Let's go make a big purchase of it yeah. so we can get it, you know, like whatever other like tools and materials that have been really challenging. I think that like, I even think about something like Etsy, which so many small makers and sellers depend on. And I feel like it actually keeps people more siloed from one another oh, yeah. than you would think. Like you think they're all on the same website, but they're all in comp- like direct competition with one another. Yeah. And what really they should be doing is combining forces and competing with Etsy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because there's enough of us small businesses to band together. (laughs) Yeah. To be like Etsy, do a better job. Shopify, get your rack together. You know, like whatever else. Like that's what it really should be. But I think that we are all us humans. Like I've got to protect myself. Yeah. You know, I can't like reach across the Instagram feed to this other business and like talk yeah. about what they're doing. Um, and I just think, you know, this idea of growing business and changing the world involves us like connecting with one another and being really honest about the challenges that we face. Yeah, because we can't take it on alone. And obviously, two heads are better than one. So yeah, coming together yeah. is the only way it'll work. And just like being straightforward about the challenges that you face. Like I think there's way too much like media around how easy it is to start a business. And there's way too many stories out there of like, I didn't even want to start a business. And now I made a million dollars. I, <laughs> that is like, if that truly happens, that is an outlier because actually doing, starting your own thing is really hard and there's crying. Yeah. There's anxiety. <laughs> there's a lot of crying. Yes. <laughs> there's a lot of like being really tired, like beyond reason. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. And I just think we need to like share that. And that's not to discourage people from starting a business. It's it's to say, hey, did you experience that today? It's okay. It's totally normal. You're not a failure. Your business is still great. You're going to succeed. It's okay to cry. It's yeah. Okay to, you know, like yeah, just making it normalized. Like this is yeah. not always <laughs> fun. It can be crazy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's, it's really tough to find that balance. Yeah. You know, because like you're doing everything. Yeah. And that's the one thing I think the biggest thing I struggle with is I can never be away from the business no matter where I go. It's that's bad. Yeah. It's emails. It's Instagram. It's I have a chat button on my website. So it's no matter where I go, if I go on vacation, like it's you're there constantly because no one else is there. It's just you. (laughs) Right. So someone chats you on the website. They're really they're literally chatting you. Yep. Right. Yeah. No matter where you are. Yeah. I mean, same thing with Instagram messages and stuff. And I think it's so crazy because 
all the small business owners I know are like, they are working 24 hours a day, like answering emails and messages and DMs and comments. And then you'll look at these like larger corporations that have like thousands of employees and they don't respond to anything. (laughs) And you're like, wait, but like, how's that fair? (laughs) Right. Yeah. You're like, I'm doing this all. Like, come on. I'm literally in a towel right now. Exactly. Answering someone's question. <laughs> right. Like I'm eating my dinner and I'm typing, answering all the questions. Like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I think, I mean, that is what it is to really be a small business. And I think we just like need more of that. And it's not all just like glamour and excitement. And also, you know, everybody thinks that everyone who has a small business is somehow getting rich off of it. Oh, yeah. Which is laughable also. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's definitely not true. I mean, like, we may be making a living, but it doesn't mean we're rich. And, <laughs> and Instagram doesn't show everything either. Like, we're not going to say, oh, my gosh, I can't make my bills this month. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And so it's like, that's why we got to, like, take back Instagram, I'm telling you. Yeah. We need to, like, make Instagram honest again. Exactly. <laughs> that's the <what we> <laughs> campaign slogan, make Instagram honest again. <laughs> I'm down. I will join. <laughs> I don't know what I'm running for, but it's just a general <laughs> campaign, just like an awareness campaign. Um, so, Almost. <laughs> I don't know what you're voting for, but yes, I appreciate your vote. <laughs> so do you have any like final like advice, words of wisdom, just a final message for everyone listening? Yeah, I think if you have an idea or you've been wanting to start a small business, just start it. You don't have to think too much about it to just begin. That's what's hard is if you go to school, like they tell you, you have to have this business plan and it has to be all planned out before you start. But sometimes that can be super overwhelming. And if I listened to that advice, I would never have started. So just yeah. just do yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, and I think that's cool. Like in the era of Instagram, it's kind of... It's kind of wild because, like, we all have this really complicated love-hate relationship with Instagram, right? Yeah. But, like, what it has done, it democratized starting a business because you don't need to, like, okay, I got to write a business plan and I'm going to go get a small business loan. Yeah. And I'm going to place an order for all these bolts of fabric and buy these machines and rent out an office space. Like, that's what it used to take to start a business, right? right. Yeah. Now you can be like, hey, I made this thing on Instagram. Does anyone like this? Someone can buy it. And then you can make two more and then people buy those and you can make four more. Yes. And like, that is so many people have started businesses in the last year during the pandemic just by doing that. And that is amazing. Right. Like, and my business is completely self-funded and you can do it if you just decide to start and you'll figure it out along the way. There's learning curves, but you can do it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think you can. I think that's really great advice. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey, for taking the time to talk to me. It was so fun. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kelsey, for taking the time to talk to me. Please go check out her amazing line. Seriously, it's so cute. It's so cool. And the fact that a small company like this can make clothes for all sizes, well, please explain why these larger companies get away with saying it's too hard because Kelsey's doing it right now. You can find Kelsey on Instagram at chaosgarner and you can find her website at chaosgarner.com. Don't worry. I'll share all of that in the show notes. You don't need to get out a pen. You don't need to pause. It's fine. You're going to get the information in a minute. (laughs) You know, every time I meet someone from our community like Kelsey, who's making amazing stuff while being truly inclusive and ethical, well, that makes me feel really excited for the future because small business is the future. I want the future to be lots of small brands doing things the ethical way while the big dogs who prioritize profit over people will become relics of the past. I mean, just imagine we're all sitting around saying, hey, Remember Nike? What a weird time we lived through. And then we all laughed because we're like, ha ha, they're gone. Like it's like the dinosaurs. We can get there by channeling our spending away from big brands and redirecting it to these small brands like KS Garner, like so many makers, designers, and sellers in our community. Like, for example, the Pegasus sponsors of Clothes Horse. We need to support them. That is how we make capitalism better than it is right now. Your money, our money, 
Maybe we don't have a lot of it, but it sure is powerful. So use that power wisely and spend it with the right people. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Close Horse. If you like what you're hearing, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends. You know, I'm like practically required by law to say those two things to you in every episode. Don't forget that you can find us on Instagram at Close Horse Podcast. And every Friday, I've been doing a super fun Instagram live at 8 p.m. Eastern time where I update you on some new blog stuff and answer your questions. So please come and check it out. It's been pretty fun. It kind of almost feels like hanging out. Also, if you want to meet other Close Horse listeners, join the Close Horsing Around Facebook group. I'll link to that in the show notes. And if you haven't listened to it yet, please go check out my other podcast, The Department, which I co-host with my friend Kim. It's totally different than Close Horse. It's my fun podcast. This is my unfun podcast. Wait, I'm not doing a very good job of selling Close Horse right now. Anyway, this week on The Department, which is coming in just a few days, we'll begin our mini series on internet dating, which has spawned so many wild social trends, so many strange phenomena that did not exist before the era of online dating. So please check it out. It's going to be really fun. (laughs) Thanks as always to Dustin Travis White for our music and audio support. Bye. (laughs) 